your eyes open for that. Oh, here we go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2015. Today, in this portion of our conference, we are going to be discussing and hearing from Moray King as he talks about hydrogen energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moray King is a favorite of ours here at the Tesla Tech Conference. He's been, been here as long as I've I can remember. He's written several books on tapping zero-point energy. They're, they're premier handbooks on how to uh, find the zero-point, find etheric energy, and utilize it in a proper way. He actually <clears throat> gave me this set of books when we very first met many, many years ago when I came to the conference to lecture on Ormus technology. Maury King's going to be talking about all the different research that's going on into hydrogen, hydrogen water cavitation, and self-running engines. So thank you. Let's welcome Moray King. Well, thank you, Bernie. Well, um, as you know, I have a synchronistic name. I match T. Henry Moray, the inventor. Uh, it really put me on a path that, that my uh, talent is one of an, being an analyst. I am really great at connecting the dots. And this year, all the pieces just fell right into place. And I really felt strongly on these electrolyzers. Something, something extra is going to happen. And I'm going to share with you uh, on this talk why in the world you would mechanically vibrate an electrolyzer and what good could that do? You'll have a no, whole new perspective on water electrolyzers. Moreover, you'll have a whole new perspective on what is driving thunderclouds. And all this was discovered because of, of videos of high-speed photography. And we'll see that, that we're going to have all this evidence that's going to put everything into place. Imagine grabbing a handful of that, that fog particle, throwing it into an in internal combustion engine chamber, putting a very big plasma discharge on that. And what happens is that piston moves with a huge anomalous force. How can fog particles be a fuel? After all, they're just nothing more than symmetric droplets of water. And when subjected to a very abrupt electrical discharge, they typically just blow apart. However, when the fog particle is small enough, they can start to dimple in. And that plasma from that big plasma discharge converts them straight into microscopic ball lightning. Microscopic ball lightning. That's the key to tapping the zero point energy. This is a plasmoid form. It's a coherent vortex ring of plasma. It's like a slinky closing on itself. It's a form that naturally wants to be maintained. But to make it requires a symmetrical template. That's where the droplet comes in. It's symmetrical so that the entire vortex ring can form all in one instant when subjected to a big discharge. Ball lightning coheres the zero point energy. It's been the, wor it's been the theme of my work since the 70s. The zero point energy can be modeled in Wheeler's theory of geometrodynamics, which is one of the most powerful of the zero point energy models. Basically, the nature of the ether or the fabric of space is like a turbulent plasma with electrical flux entering and electrical flux leaving. And it's, uh, they called it this activity uh, as turbulence. They, uh, Wheeler named it the quantum foam. It's the, the flux is centered from a higher dimensional space. That's where it comes from. As it enters our space and leaves our space to create the zero point vacuum fluctuation. This side view, that, that slot, that flatland slot, is our three-dimensional space. That flux comes at right angles, orthogonal to our three-dimensional space. On the left, it's like the incoherent vacuum fluctuations. If there's a slight tilt to it as it comes through, we call it the polarized vacuum. If there's vorticity as it comes through, that's the elementary particles in this model. The, f the flow of the zero-point energy is like the flow of a stream, and the particle is like the whirlpool. And it contain the constant zero-point energy flux is needed to maintain all elementary particles in existence. Self-organization can occur in the vacuum, and it tends to form up into pairs, electron-positron pairs. They come to life, they disappear, they come to life, they disappear, all coming from that vacuum energy flux. 
the key to activating and getting excess energy comes from the nuclei of plasmas. The nuclei have steep lines of vacuum polarization on them, and when they abruptly move, or abrupt, abruptly surge, or abruptly jerk in the plasma, they bend a little bit out of flux into our three-dimensional space. You'll typically manifest as voltage spikes, anomalous excess spiking energy. That energy can be captured by the vortex ring the plasmoid vortex ring, it ortho-rotates, at right angle rotates, it traps that energy into that precessional form that is the vortex ring, and all of a sudden we have anomalies appearing on these ball lightning events. They exhibit self-acceleration like a miniature flying saucer, they just take off on their own. They exhibit excessive force and excessive energy. What's the evidence in nature? The thundercloud will turn out to be the evidence from nature. Uh, the thundercloud, every lightning stroke has a precursor of ball lightning. Could you play this? Thank you. Every lightning stroke has a precursor that's ball lightning. Okay. Now let's let's let's. Uh, let's keep going. We can't, if you can't play that one, we move to the next. Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, you, there's lots of web, lots of, uh, lots of pictures on the web, lots of uh, high-speed video of lightning events, and you'll see them. This came off the Ken Shoulder site. Above the thundercloud, there's even more energetic activity that's even greater than what's happening below the thundercloud. They have the blue jets and they have the sprites, and the sprites come from the halo. That sprite is huge. We're talking 30 miles wide, 30 miles wide, 50 miles high, 50 miles associated with a single lightning stroke and it, it occurs at one one-thousandth of a second. On the order of milliseconds, this event is happening. It was only from high-speed photography that they discovered this and could prove what's happening, and now they started to study it. Uh, can you play this one? Let's try this one. This is some high-speed photography of the Sprite event. This is looping the one event. This was a millisecond event, and you'll see as it repeats, the sprite originates from the halo above it. Every big lightning stroke has one of these above it. And it's huge. Okay. The energetics are amazing. And guess what they see they're composed of? Ball lightning, big ones, 10 meters. 10 meters in size, big ball of lightning, traveling approximately the tenth of the speed of light. Launch from the halo, and this is the source of the antimatter. This is a vacuum energy self-organizing event, and that's why the antimatter is created, with the gamma rays as well. And basically, they were able to detect that in the uh, Fermi satellite, where the antimatter struck the satellite itself. They didn't realize at the time they made this video that it was coming from the Sprite. That knowledge came along later. We have evidence in experiments. This has actually been observed for a long time. At Harvard University, Professor Trowbridge, all the way back in 1907, noticed that if you spray some water mist into electric arc, it's a lot louder. The bang is a lot louder. Didn't know why. Professor Frungel in World War II observed the same thing at, the, at his university in Germany, and he measured that the force is not from heat or steam. He could not explain where the force came from. There were applications that he was involved with later just to do a, an abrupt discharge, echo sounding, to measure the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they use it for, electro, uh, for mold, pushing a plate into a mold with the shock wave from the electric shock from the abrupt discharge. They use it for rock fragmentation. There was one report back in 1969 showing the 
uh, an overunity event. They measured it was 150%. Excess energy was being manifested here. And they just said, oh, you must have made a measurement error and proceeded to ignore it. Peter Grenou made a career out of studying this. He was an MIT professor. And he did abrupt electrical discharge in water. And here's the key thing he discovered. That discharge from the capacitor must be extremely fast. If it's not, if not abrupt enough, nothing special happens. Just a little discharge in water. But when it is extremely fast, he throws a weight up into the air. The high-speed photography could measure a plasmoid in the barrel little ball lightning event, and he would have accidents that would blow the chamber apart, blow, blow out the bolts. So he didn't quite measure all the energy that was being manifested. However, electrical engineering professor Gary Johnson at Kansas State University uh, designed his chamber to blow apart. That's spherical weights with the water inside and the abrupt electrical discharge, and those weights would be propelled up guide wires. And he could just photograph how high they got thrown into the air. And he proved he had excess energy and excess force. He knew how much force he had, how much energy he had on his capacitor. And when he throw, saw, measured how high he f flung those weights up the guide wire, he made a definitive experiment showing over unity. And pretty well, he, it was, uh, he did this work in the 90s. And it's been pretty well ignored by the standard academic community. But there you go, an over-unity experiment is, is, that's completely repeatable. This is a website uh, that tries to harvest this idea for electrical explosions in water and see if we can just brute force make a fuel out of it. But the real key came from high-speed photography on the latest work of, uh, from Peter Grenou up at George Hathaway's laboratory, where they finally were able to capture on that type of 35,000 frames per second camera that the source of all this excess force and excess anomaly was from micron-sized fog particles coming off the surface of the water, being propelled off the surface. This fog was cool, and it manifested this excess energy, microscopic ball lightning was the source behind this. And that's what, we want, that's what we want to put in our internal combustion engine, microscopic ball lightning. David Faust is a good friend of mine that just passed away last year. When I met him in the 70s, he was an expert on Kirlian photography, corona discharge photography. He published uh, in Science Magazine a definitive article on showing what that's all about. He had very good equipment at the university. He could uh, create abrupt kilovolt unipolar discharges. And he, we remembered there was reports of anomalies of ball lightning coming off a of Kirlian apparatus, so we checked it out. He had low light level cameras so we could watch it. And he could pretty well just from a single pulse and spraying some water mist on the, on the on Kirlian photography plate, he would watch events that could last for over a minute and he could see them with the low light level cameras. And he was able to measure that. And little did we know at the time in the 70s that he was foreshadowing the work of Ken Shoulders who made a lifetime of studying these microscopic ball lightning events. Ken would just abrupt discharge from a capacitor from a very sharp point cathode can launch a tiny little charge cluster. It would make craters in, in the conductor when it hit it. He would see, gee, I'm getting a lot of energy from that. By the way, that patent is beautifully written. He wrote it itself. It's not legal ease. It's, it's a patent that's actually fun to read. Uh, he called them electron validum. It's Latin for strong charge. Later on, when he was convinced he had excess energy from the vacuum energy, he changed the acronym to Exotic Vacuum Objects, EVOs. They contain about 100 billion electrons, 100,000 ions. But here's the interesting thing. It always manifests the charge to mass ratio just like the electron. Mesyats was the president of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He likewise studied these. He called them ectons. Um, he can, he showed that they come from the liquid metal just before, this is a blow up of the point, sharp pointed cathode. Just before the discharge, a little liquid metal would come off the tip. 
And then the tip of that little protuberance would explode off and that little blob of liquid metal would be sufficient to form the vortex ring around it. So we have the liquid metal as the substrate to make the ball lightning. And we, see, we tie that as tiny droplets with the substrate to make the ball lightning. Uh, he made positive ones. They were rare, but he would make them capture on photography. Um, and they would have a charge to mass ratio like the positron, but they were not comprised of positrons. There was no annihilation events, no gamma rays or anything else. It's just somehow the vacuum, when it gives rise to these, wants to have the charge to mass ratio very similar to the positron or the electron. With something very fundamental in the way the vacuum wants to self-organize and create something from it that's macroscopic, but it has that charge to mass ratio. He would make pairs, just like pair production, a positive one and a negative one. He would make black ones, is what he called. Uh, they would go dark, and then a little pulse could reactivate them, a little voltage pulse could reactivate them. I believe what Dave Faust measured was the dark ones that would just, uh, he could see them with the low light level cameras. The, uh, he, Ken Shoulders discovered a huge anomaly from this, what he called the cascade effect. If he could take one of these little EVs and, sh and shoot it through a vortex of water, tiny vortex of water, uh, he would ionize the entire vortex in a coherent way from the vacuum and then tremendously amplify the force that comes off of that. He called it a water gun. He could not find any way to harvest that force. It was so powerful, it would damage anything it hit. He used the analogy of, oh, it's like shooting a bullet at a windmill blade. Just goes right through. So this, this was, the, the important thing about this experiment, it shows you can cascade, you get involved with matter vortexes, and you shoot small ball lightning into it, it can start to cohere larger energetic events. Inventors have stumbled across this, typically inadvertently. Uh, Stan Meyer, uh, is famous for his dune buggy that, that ran on water. But this was the last device. This is the device why he was murdered, because he was threatening to, to mass produce these water fuel injector plugs. And the big advantage of this pr particular invention was that he could retrofit automobiles. He threatened to retrofit automobiles to run on water. So, so he thought. He didn't know what he's really doing, this is making microscopic ball lightning coming from this. He mixed water, ionized air, and so, some inert gas. And that, that mixture, would, when subjected to the big pulse, big electrical pulse, would make lots of tiny ball, ball lightning from the mist. Then you squirt it into it. So, then, so Stan Meyer, that injector plug, was a ball lightning launcher for microscopic ball lightning. Now this is from the Canadian patent, and you can see it's, it was a complex circuit, especially when he had to pre-ionize the air. When we see energetic fog from the water ex electrolyzers, that's a clue that we're getting onto the right mode of operating the electrolyzer. The electrolyzer famous because of Yul Brown studied the energetics of it, especially around the welding torch, and he could not explain why that welding torch was so powerful. He suggested atomic hydrogen and oxygen. HHO is, is the chemical symbol for that. And that's why this name stuck. Everybody calls it HHO. It's because it's Yule Brown's first hypothesis trying to explain why it was so energetic. George Weissman, I credit to be the first to suspect there's something else there. He called it electrically expanded water, some type of a clustering thing going on. And I thought George was right on. Uh, I thought I, I was on completely on the same page when I first started investigating this. So I credit George going back historically, to, and he called it electrically expanded water for suggesting the water cluster, something is, else is happening from, from that electrolyzer. Uh, Ron Mitchell was recently on a YouTube where he gets an accident. He doesn't know why and what triggered it, but when he observes a cold fog coming off of this, uh, some of the time, and when you get a cool fog, you know you're on the right track. When, you're, uh, when you get your electrolyzer vibrating to produce that type of thing. 
this video shows the sputtering on the surface just above the HHO launcher from coming from the water. Could you play this, John, please? This is recording the HHO, HHO gas coming off of the cell. The important thing to realize here is it's churning, it's sputtering. Big bubbles can fall back as little bubbles. The more you get the bubbles smaller and smaller, the more likely those bubbles will be able to be converted into ball lightning as simple, rather than just fly apart. So the trick is on these electrolyzers to get a lot more sputtering effects. That's the point of vibrating them. We're trying to break up the bubbles to make them very, very tiny. I guess that song, Tiny Bubbles, was the key to, to zero point energy. <laughs> I'm relieved. Um, this is a suggestion. This is from the HHO for Free site, where there's a discussion group uh, around these ideas. And it's a good idea an ultrasonic fog fogger, right, that, that makes fog gas. And you can make more small bubbles that way. I think Omasa, Ryushin Omasa, is the master of making the right type of tiny bubbles with his, his apparatus. We're well, about to show a video. It, it, I think he nailed it, completely nailed it. Uh, in this video, you'll see he's running a small engine with no air input at all. He was able to store his gas under pressure because he leaks hydrogen intentionally. He does not want to store hydrogen at all. He just wants to store the, this nanoscopic gas, this nanobubble type gas. Um, he made an acronym, and coincidentally, it sounds just like his name. <laughs> Could you play this video? Now, this is in Japanese. This came out in 2009. And, uh, but you can read the subtitles in English, and this really summarizes uh, his contribution. Tokyo Otaku no front maker, Nihon Techno.日本テクノの大政社長が開発したこの核反機従来のようなプロペラが回転するものではなく低周波の振動で核反する中の水は安定して循環するという洗剤を入れても泡が全く立たない一体なぜか通常電気分解すると酸素と水素が発生するしかし大政社長が過去にこの核反機を使って滅気をしたところ難点とされる大きな泡や水素の爆発が発生しなかった振動が伝わってるために表面張力が壊れてですね泡が形成しようとっても
7月に酸水素ガスを用いてある実験を成功させた<音声>タンクに貯めた酸水素ガスを燃料に小型エンジンを動かすことができた空気の取り込み口は塞いでいるガスの中に酸素があるため燃焼時に空気中の酸素が必要ないからだ水からできた燃料のため燃焼後はまた水に戻り有害な排ガスは発生しないという非常に安定な圧力を加えても爆発しないインフラとして整備して自由に給油でと同じように給ガスができるようなはい、あの状況が作れればあの自動車の燃料として置き換わる可能性というのは十分にあってガスの正体を調べようと大政社長は液化を試みた酸素はマイナス183度水素はマイナス253度で液化するがこのガスはおよそマイナス178度で液化した行動はわからないにしても新しいえー、地球上でその水の第二の水ができたエンジンとか発電機だとかあ今あの化石燃料に代わるものが水から作れてまた水に戻るというふうに、えー、究極のね、えー、地球を救うね、えー、燃料ですよね全ての燃料にしたいと解明できていない部分が多い酸水素ガスだが大きな可能性を秘めている Uh, there's, the, there's the acronym.、Uh, they, they show the vibrator. You can see how wide the、uh, plates are, the little vibrating vein.、Uh, ran a little scooter, 100% on Omasa gas. Ran a car, but now he's mixing it with 50%、uh, liquid petroleum gas. Now, that's the first surprise. Why, you just discovered. Whole new fuel. Why are you clouding the science by mixing it with a natural gas? Did he get suppressed? Well, we'll see. The generator experiments, those are the ones I really recommend because that's where you can really prove if we have a new energy source or not.、Uh, that was an interesting graphic. I did not get That translated looks like two kilowatt hours in and five kilowatt hours out. I'm not sure what he's saying on that, but it seemed like is this an over unity thing? This one was translated. A Japanese friend was able to translate this, and he, he said the top cylinder is the Omasa gas. It cost him 10 kilowatt hours to make it.、Uh, it would then produce 20 kilowatt hours worth of energy coming from that. And then the bottom cylinder was propane. And there's 20 kilowatt hours coming from that. And then for a total of 40 kilowatt hours. Why are you obscuring your scientific discovery by mixing it with propane?、Um, this makes me believe、uh, that he is working with the powers that be, that he has to back off this, this huge claim that he, that he has excess energy. No more information on the web after 2012 on Amasa. All the information is earlier. Uh, looking over his patents was very interesting. His expertise was the vibrator. He, it was his main, he was a mechanical engineer. The application was the emulsification of powders for electroplating and, and that sort of thing. He could really get a good mixture in the water. It was only an afterthought that he tried to, to use electrolysis with that water while, while he was vibrating. That's when he made the discovery. And look at the dates of when he made these patent applications. This is very old information. This is all the way back、uh, through 2002. 2008 was a reapp reapplying with a few extra claims, the earlier patent.、Uh, the newest patent application was 2009, just before the release of that video that we watched.、Uh, and so 
we'll focus on some of these patents to see what, exactly what he's doing. There's the electrolysis plates in the middle, and there's the fluttering veins on each side. There's a blow up the fluttering veins. He really focuses on how on, on getting that vein to vibrate back and forth. This was a surprise. He has holes drilled in his plates, his electrolyzer plates. That's an odd thing to do if you're trying to make hydrogen because you want as much surface air as you can for your current. Uh, the purpose of those holes is so that water, vibrating water, would get into that electrolyzer, get right into the heart of it. He patented vibrating electrodes as well, but as you can imagine, that'd be pretty tough to do. I do not know if he actually built this or not, but he found that he didn't need to. The norm, the, just a flexible plate on a static electrolyzer was sufficient to give him everything he needed. Uh, he really talked a lot in the patent about maximizing that tip, but how the displacement on the tip and, and shaking that back and forth as fast as possible. Uh, he said he wants to maximize the flutter, and so he would adjust his mechanical frequency, which is around, well, it was operating around 100 hertz on his mechanical vibrator, but he would adjust that frequency to maximize the snapping action of the tip of the, of the veins or the blades. Guess what? When you move a very fast, create snapping action on a blade, you make cavitation bubbles. And then, then when I realized that, it ties to the work of Mark LeClaire that I presented in 2012. The cavitation bubble forms like a vortex ring going right through the heart of the torus is the reentrant jet. And all the energy of that collapsing bubble gets concentrated into the reentrant jet on the right under extreme pressures, which converts the water into a solid state. And the size of that is, is, is on the order of a nanometer wide. And Mark LeClaire's discovery was they uh, have a plasma bow shock wave that has all these energetic anomalies. These reentrant jets would self-accelerate. They would carve trenches. And when, when he shared his work with me, I lit up. I said, at the tip, that's the same discovery as Ken Shoulders, EVs or EVOs. He's discovering the same phenomena, but it's happening from water. Right? So the, he not, Mark LeClaire just knocked my socks off. That's why I had to feature him back in 2012 when I, when I first learned of his work. He controls the cavitation. He, he notices they naturally, that, ca that reentrant jet from that collapsing bubble naturally wants to target a hole. Right? And that connects to Omasa's reason for having the holes in the plates. They're shooting reentrant jets at the holes. Here's the apparatus that Mark was using for his experiments. So basically, that snapping action, maximizing the displacement and snapping action at tip, is to launch reentrant jets. So as it's vibrating, Oh, that's not, the animation's not running. It, it, as it vibrates back and forth, it launches reentrant jets right off the tip. There, Mark LeClaire and Omasa are not the only ones to put reentrant jets to use. Watch what pistol shrimp can do. John, could you play this, please? Those cavitation bubbles are tapping the zero point energy. To do that. Mark LeClaire also discovered that these reentrant jets can form loops if they're long enough or if two of them pass each other. Two of them, because they're positively charged on the bow and negatively charged on the back end. And they'll, not, they'll tend to form loops. And if the loops are small enough, it can form the basis of a water cluster getting, uh, in the water itself. And then and thus have a form, uh, a form that could support the small bubbles. Omasa gradually improved. He talked about in the final patent application his eight, his eight embodiments, but it's really the same physical embodiment and most of the improvement was, was working with his a signal generator, trying to find the right square wave and, and, and the right modulation, etc. He, he really, and you could see, he just gradually improved his yield up to 58 liters per minute of his, his gas. Uh, this is the specs on the final embodiment. Notice uh, those plates. 
I mean, he would work with the standard textbooks on electrolysis. He used the best stuff that, that could be used. And their platinum, cl uh, platinum plated titanium for the anode. No expense was spared. He was extremely well funded on this project. Um, use standard um, this, uh, electrolyte. It's pretty well uh, what are typically used in electrolysis. And he had those holes in the plate. There were some surprises when I read the patent. Oh, working with a pH of 14, I'm going, what are you thinking? That's incredibly dangerous and very caustic. But imagine every pulse coming off his, his pulse generator. You're going, it's the water so conductive, you've launched a little plasma right there in the water for every single pulse. And he got pretty good results. So you imagine that's happening, plus all these reentry jets are entering into the electrolysis plates. I mean, he has one heck of a activity going on, and he got a pretty good yield from that. Give you an idea on the size of the nanobubbles that he wanted. Here's the size in nanometers of the hydrogen molecule, and, and the typical cluster that can form up around it. Imagining trapping a little bit of hydrogen in that cluster. What happens is it lifts right out of the water like a balloon, a nanometer size balloon at, at the nanometer scale. And that's, that's the point of having the hydrogen. It just comes right out of the electrolyzer. And it's all cocooned up, right? It, it, can't, it can't react. It's trapped inside the bubble. We're making little balloons, right? That's the key thing, because those little balloons will support the formation of ball lightning around them. Uh, he did experiments with liquefying the gas when he found out, you know, after he thaws it out, let's come right back to the gas. Uh, it exhibits all the properties of the Brown's gas torch. It can sublimate tungsten, which just came right back as, as if he freshly made it. He tried to store, he did experiments storing under pressure, and this is extremely dangerous because you know a Brown's gas explodes around 30 psi. Look what he did, he tried 2,000 atmospheres on his gas. Well, remember, when he puts it under pressure, his containment intentionally leaks any stray hydrogen. He does not want hydrogen involved in these experiments because no, he knows it's too dangerous. So he makes sure he vents the hydrogen and he does these, it blew, blew me away that he tried an experiment like that. Uh, notice a small spark above his, his water bath did not ignite the gas. It will just ignite HHO standard electro electrolysis gas right away, but he had it so cocooned up in those bubbles that there wasn't any reaction to a small spark. This also, right in the middle of the patent application is a gratuitous paragraph that mentions element transmutation. Element transmutation, like turning lead into gold, that type of thing. What's that doing in there? It just out of the blue in the patent. But he must have either heard, or this is back in 2009, or observed something going on along these lines. Uh, but however it was measured, that was Marc Leclerc's big announcement in 2012. Those reentrant jet strikes onto, a, onto metal create nucleosynthesis. They create transmutation events. And Marc Leclerc's not alone because Ken Scholler's was showing the same thing from the EV strikes where the tiny ball lightning hitting a target creates nucleosynthesis transmutation events. But the best, one, best experiments for that was Adamenko at his Proton 21 laboratory in the Ukraine. They would strike with me a centimeter sized ball lightning. They would strike a very pure target, in this case copper, and when they blew the thing, blew the thing from the crater, that, just from the strike, they would have nucleosynthesis all over, elements all over the periodic table. Right? This is the best transmutation experiments on the planet. They have a conference in Russia every single year uh, to talk about these experiments, to repeat these experiments, to come up with new theories of the nucleus. Their, their professors are paid to study this. And what does Western academia, how do they look at this? They ignore it. I'm, I'm this one. So let's, let's kind of summarize. What we just see here 
that water is incredibly remarkable on all these things that it can do. And then when we get into this ball lightning, it just created enough symmetry to create ball lightning. So the real question is, how can us inventors, right? You guys are going to change the world by replicating this. What can we do? What can we do uh, from this, this knowledge to, to allow us to take advantage of this? Remember the goal. The goal is to, to break your big bubbles up to tiny stable bubbles. Those stable bubbles will form the ball lightning. The electrolyzer with the hydrogen naturally lifts them right out. So the, one of the things you want to do, this is why the sputtering and turbulence and cavitation and very narrow gap electrolyzers where this type of activity occurs between the surface of the water and, and where the gas is being produced uh, really helps. Uh, the the uh, Anton cell was used in the project as a very good narrow gap electrolyzer coming out of Germany. Uh, Steve Eaton wanted to share with the world his discovery in 2009. He had a very narrow gap in the electrolyzer, but what was very significant what he did is he used like a fishing line, forcing the water and the gas to spiral all the way up. And he had to keep, keep it in that chamber. He had to extend its length to uh, uh, about 16 inches. In order to, to, get, to get enough powerful gas, what was he doing in that sputtering? He was causing whatever big bubbles he had to turn to small bubbles. That was the point. Tiny, he didn't know that at the time. He just said, somehow I'm making the hydrogen more energetic somehow. But what he did was he made a self-running generator, a genset self-running, and look, nothing fancy at all about his waveform. It was just a simple DC excitation. It was nothing fancy going on there. But what was fancy was having all that activity in the water uh, gas surface, spiraling all the way up on those electrodes. Oliver and Valentine used the Anton cell, and they likewise, working with a very small generator, uh, that was very inefficient, but a little cheapy out of China. They uh, jerry-rigged the, the electronics to control the timing, the timing of the spark plugs. You want to fire this at top dead center, and you don't want to fire it during the waste spark. And so that's what that was all about. They, too, mounted it on the cart with the electrolyzer on the cart, and the electrolyzer was subjected to the vibration, natural vibration from the motor, from the generator itself. And while I learned from Steve Eaton's partner, Jeff Sokol, he said, yes, uh, Steve Eaton also had the electrolyzer on top of the generator and was subjected to the engine's vibration at the same time. So it was, it was quite a coincidence. Both of, both of these inventors have been suppressed. No more communication at all on the web. They're very enthusiastic about participating in open source. Nothing from them anymore. I uh, realized that that cl closed loop, running a gen set with no other input energy, the, electro the electrolysis is, uh, is producing the gas and the generator produces the electricity. This is a spectacular claim. It, this, this is so out of bounds, nearly everyone who knows any science at all also says this hot that claim has to be a fraud. Hydrogen can't do it. And hydrogen and combustion can't do it. Well, they're right when they say hydrogen and combustion can't do it. Not so much because it costs you a little more energy to break apart water than you ever get back by burning the hydrogen. That's not where the big loss is. It's in the internal combustion engine itself. Those things, those are cheapy little generators, internal combustion engine, 20% efficient, right? This means that you've lost 80% of your energy is just to heat, right? That's why anybody who knows science says this has to be impossible. But here, for well, whatever is going on, if you can self-run a gen set, just idle it. You're talking about a phenomenon at least 5x over unity, five times over unity, 500%. Just to idle it, this proves you have a new energy source, just, just if you can get it that far. You know, and the two guys that did it say, I can also light up a light bulb and everything else. It's spectacular claim. This is the proof. So whatever phenomenon is moving that piston, it is not combustion. And so what do we want to do? Here's the other tip. We want to convert those tiny little droplets to ball lightning, so we want to use a big plasma discharge spark plug, not just a weeny little spark. We want a huge plasma event in, in, on that fog gas. And this was a very good website. I really recommend Patrick Kelly's ebook. 
because he keeps refreshing it and keeps working on improving it. It's wonderful information. And he discusses the Firestorm spark plug by Robert Krupa. He intentionally shapes the electrodes to make a plasma, spherical plasma discharge. Uh, here's a little prototype. And in the patent, he shows all the variants of his electrodes. Uh, this was interesting, dimpling in the electrodes. He discovered this empirically. And what does that do? I like this idea because when you have the dimpled, uh, you have glow plasma building up in, in the spaces just before the discharge. And when you have a lot of glow plasma first, it creates a you know, uniform spherical surface. So the whole thing comes out uh, on the, upon the discharge. So it really gets a wide plasma discharge from, from this type of spark plug. So this is the critical thing that you want to use this with the generator. The generator, because we're trying to ignite the tiny bubbles. And that's the into ball lightning. Uh, on the HHO for free website, it mentions a few links to uh, commercial spark plugs designing to do lot, a big plasma discharge, typically used for race cars, right? They're trying to get all they can from it for a gasoline combustion. Uh, the Pulsar spark plug was interesting because it was a cylindrical capacitor. So you build up the capacitor and they discharge it all at once. And so you can try some of these commercial plugs with the generator. The halo spark plug, this was uh, invented by uh, David Yerth, who speaks here. He speak there, I spoke here a couple years ago, but it happens to live near me. This project happened, I think, 2011, time frame, 2010. Uh, the next town up from where I left, I had no idea that it existed. Can you play this, John? Can you push the play button? And you'll see he'll have some fog gas coming from the bottom. Uh, here he's discharging the the spark plug with, with no gas coming on it, just showing the spherical nature of its discharge. Now the fog gas is coming from his, his special electrolyzer. Thank you. On his project, he excited his electrolyzer with counter-rotating magnets. Uh, this is what's called an archetype idea. People dream this thing up, how, uh, having one spin and the opposite direction spin, counter-rotation, and he has the magnets opposing each other. And he excited his electrolyzer th that way. Uh, I really like this idea because the Russian torsion field theory is about activating vacuum energy. So whenever you want to get something from the vacuum, you want to pr always produce it in pairs, just like pair production. So you have a right-handed spin and you must do a left-handed spin at the same time because the vacuum wants to yield, conserve angular momentum as it yields up its uh, pairs. So it's the, this is the Russian torsion field theory. So it matches the revelation that it, this is a dream machine. Inventors keep dreaming this. And you'll see a website there that they can make flying saucers or any gravity or whatnot. Uh, from it, so dream on, right? <laughs> but that's what they did to excite the electrolyzer. Here's uh, some uh, magnets mounted in the st as rotor. Um, you see that it's only eight plates on his little electrolyzer. wasn't wasn't much at all. And he pushes it together, and then they excite it. So to wrap up, uh, cloud particles, just a tiny droplets. We want tiny droplets of cloud. When they're small enough, they can dimple in in response to an abrupt discharge. When they dimple in, that is a torus form that makes the plasmoid, makes the ball lightning. The ball lightning has all the anomalies being observed of self-acceleration, excess energy. It, it ortho-rotates the vacuum energy in and traps it into the ball lightning. And cascading can occur, where if it gets involved in a vortex or involved with other ball lightning, it can get bigger. The thundercloud activity was exhibiting all this. We learned it from the high-speed photography. And so we have this small ball lightning precursors from lightning. And above the thundercloud, we have the sprites, the halo, and the big ball lightning events occurring in the sprites. 
The high-speed photography finally nailed what's going on in the water arc ex experiments, where the anomaly was coming from, and it was coming from the submicron fog particles, is what was it showing where the anomaly of the force was finally coming from. Thus, vibrate, the point of vibrating electrolyzer is to break big bubbles into tiny bubbles. That's the point. Any means of vibration can help. Uh, this is a good idea where you could take an electric motor and have an off-balance off flywheel and you can control the mechanical vibration just by the speed of the electric motor. So therefore you can kind of discover by tuning it, so to speak, adjusting the speed to kind of maximize fog coming off your electrolyzer. So a little tip like this can help maximize the production of the tiny, tiny bubbles. Omasa's floating blades, was, I would say, is the, 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 the best Cadillac device illustrating this, this point because he's launching cavitation reentrant jets off the tip of the blades, and they can also help form the tiny bubbles in the water itself, very stable and, and trap a little bit of hydrogen. The idea of the hydrogen, you trap it in the bubble and it lifts right out of the water. But you want the hydrogen is just helping you get the bubble out and you want the bubble. That was the key. The bubble would form the ball lightning. The, using plasma spark plugs, big plasma spark plugs, ignite all those tiny bubbles simultaneously into ball lightning form inside the internal combustion engine. And thus you can convert an internal combustion, combustion engine into essentially a zero point energy device, just like Stan Meyer's dream. So thunder clouds tap the zero point energy. We should too. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, um, the books are out there. Steve Ellswick's uh, table and Tom Ballone's table. Uh, there's my name synchronicity. I was destined to write that book. Actually, that called because that, that was the most requested uh, talk for copies of my slides. I got the cover story for Infinite Energy Magazine in December 2012 on this very topic. Uh, this was a discussion on a YouTube that I had with Gary Hendershot. What's stopping us? Well, what, what's stopping us? Do you think it's the men in black? Can you guess what the number one thing that stops the progress in this field? What is the number one thing, number one suppression cause? Okay. <laughs> Dang, you got it. Uh, number one is, is, is actually belief. What I've discovered, and I, I'm trying to recruit inventors. They, they try all this stuff. The HHL community is very bright, very bright inventors. The smarter you are, the more science you know, right? If you don't know about zero point energy, you just know standard engineering science. And st standard engineering science is just like it was when I went to school. It was uh, it's not taught. There is no zero point injury. What's the engineer's view? What's his paradigm? Empty space is empty. There's nothing there, right? So when I work with inventors, they're bright. Their talent is, they're, they're, they're smart, they know their standard science, and their talent is building things. And thus, they know there's nothing there, it's, it's just hydrogen. And when you're good, you make hydrogen effectively. We know how to make hydrogen. And the better you are, at making hydrogen, the more hydrogen you make, and you miss the point. You miss the point entirely. We want bubbles, tiny, tiny bubbles. So it's the belief that stops them. Then after you succeed, then the men in black come along, and then, and then the oil company, and then you get into all the other suppression stories that you see. But you can see what's happening as people succeed in self-running a genset. That's immediately a red flag that says, you, you really did it, right? Because it's impossible to do it with, with, with combustion, I mean, because of all the losses. So that is the flag of success. And we get thousands of inventors making self-running gensets. We will, we will have the army needed to be, easily beat suppression. So that's the key. This slide presentation can be downloaded from that website where all my presentations on this topic are, are, are available for download. And I guess... Do you have time for questions? Yes, we do have time for questions. How much? Five minutes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Five minutes for questions, if anyone wants to come up to the microphone.
it on now? Okay, great. That was great. Thanks for that presentation. That was Thank good. You. Um, have you looked into Roger Stringham's work with sonoluminescence? Yes. Similar? They, he, well, he's on a different paradigm. He's on creating a fusion from the event. But he knows those reentry jets from the capitation bubbles. He knows something remarkable is coming from them. And, uh, you know, that was the first, infinite, uh, first issue of Infinite Energy magazine. He's on the cover of that. And I was so happy. I said, yeah, he's, he's nailing this. I, I didn't know about the transmutation experiments. That didn't come along to 2012, as far as what I've learned. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot I had to pull out. I mean, I have so many connections to this. I could not show it all in one presentation. Any other questions? Coming up. So can you clarify on that uh, gas generator that ran for 20 minutes? Why did it die after 20 minutes? Oh, he, he stopped it. What? It didn't. It didn't die. Has he has he run it for a day, two days, three days? It's an interesting story on him. He was attempting to go open source, right? He was trying to go open source. This was to, to, he he. The reason he teamed with Jeff Sokol is because holy cow, I really got something here. Jeff Sokol was already successful in an HHO business selling electrolyzers for diesel tractor trailers because they really can help the efficiency. And of course, the emissions was the important one. They could clean up the burn and everything else. And then he consulted with, uh, with um, George Wiseman. And he said, you better go open source with this. The men are, you're going to get shut right down. So he attempted to do that. So he went to Sterling Allen on the Pez Wiki site. This was November Friday the 13th, November 13th in 2009, I call it the peak, the peak of the HHO because he was attempting to open source. The very night they posted it, the website was attacked, right? And they had to put, the, put it back together. I think there was only two uh, replications attempted from this. He, he, Steve Eaton all of a sudden turned to Jeff Sokol and says, give me back everything. Jeff Sokol published the plans in his ebook, and he says, remove it all. I'm no longer participating. Goodbye. Done. Nothing ever from Steve Eaton again. If you go and try to get some of those U YouTubes of Steve Eaton, he, was, uh, he has a master's degree in nuclear engineering. This guy was a bright engineer with incredible talent as an inventor. And you see some of his other inventions. He was not lying. Right? I was convinced he really had it, and he wanted to go open source. So he's trying to get it out as fast as possible. Right, and that was, that was the goal. And now we have no more communication. Right? So, and he didn't know what I explained to you today. He just, well, I guess it's hydrogen. Somehow I'm making the hydrogen more energetic as it spirals up. He didn't know. Right? Just like Omasa doesn't necessarily know. I don't think Omasa knows he's making reentrant jets. What would be your ideal outcome? of what you want to have happen with all this information that you've compiled? What would be your ideal situation? Replication by a million inventors. We're going to have to do it at the inventing level, because I'll tell you, academia won't touch it. I wonder if it was possible for the high voltage the discharge in the water would be a good propellant for a cannon. A can? A cannon. Oh, a can. Well, it gets into the PAP story, doesn't it? The same phenomenon is happening in the PAP engine. It's just happening with their inert gas clusters, and he made an explosive device. Kind of silly. But yes, you can blow things up, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it was a pretty powerful, uh, could be a very powerful propellant. You could launch a well, it is. I mean, like way. we showed, if you can self run a genset, it's over the top powerful. It's, it, is, it can't be combustion, something, uh, we got, we're talking about at least a 5x event, 5x over humidity, 500% over unity, oh. just to get that far. This, this is over the top powerful. Hmm. I suppose you could make an engine if you had little tiny droplets of water, exploded them in the combustion chamber, each uh, Well, that's the point. Rotation. Yeah, that was the point. Yeah. Put, put the fog gas in, the combustion chamber. The point of the big spark plug was to get it all ion, all converted to plasmoids or ball lightning, and then it, take advantage of that anomalous force on the piston. Mm. Right? That's how, and that's I believe that's what Stan Meyer did with this final invention. We've got two more questions. One and two. 
This is a little bit off topic, but you wrote a book about Henry T. Moray, and I've been working on some of his, um, his uh, processes. And do you have any insight? I haven't read your book. Maybe I should do that first before I ask you. Do you have any insight into what he was doing when he was tuning these air coils with these magnets? Uh, I, I have what appears, you know, I have the literature that's available, and I made all the circuits, and I've tuned them. I'm even mixing some technologies with the QEG and a few things like that. What was he actually, how was he able to actually resonate a whole basket of frequencies of different wavelengths uh, in, and keep them uh, in, uh, uh, in, with the, in the same interval? I know he used ionization, and that was substituted. I realized that. I looked through that. I don't know if any of those things I see, though, is really what he used. I just, it was in the book. I assume he's using ionization as the mechanism to take the top off the, uh, uh, the power that he couldn't handle, and then when it comes back around, of course, it's a lower, at a lower level, and he can't. Can you tell me anything about that? Yes. Good. <laughs> yes, but not now. Um, there, there's actually, I, that, the book was the result of uh, a presentation I, I gave in 2003, and I was badgered by everybody for copies of the slides. And because I like picture books myself, I said, I'm going to make that book, my presentation, into a slideshow. So uh, start with the book, and then there's, there's actually plenty of extra information on the web. And by the way, John Moore has shared with me, they were, uh, they were doing, after they smashed the device and was threatened out of it, for the rest of his life, they were, ma they were able to make uh, torus plasmoids in the tubes, and for the rest of the, his research was transmutation studies. That's what he did for the entire time. He had to abandon, he had to abandon, so he made ball lightning in the plasma, and he had to abandon the energy research because of all the threats. And so he was done. Yeah, and they, they, were looking, they were looking for gold, and that was very proprietary, you know, and, and sort of thing. I have two quick things. Uh, can you briefly discuss anything you know about people that are using water structuring pre-electrolysis, uh, vortexing the water first? Yeah, there, there, could, there could be uh, effective things. We know there's water clustering effects. Kind of featured Mark LeClaire's variant on that from the re-entrant jets. And I, I think uh, you can, if you make very good clusters already in the water, when they come out, they can then go right into the ball lightning. Uh, and that's why maybe some really good water, uh, you know, that's energized, quote, right? Because we don't know a whole lot of, about water structure and water clustering. But when you, when you have it already in that form, it could be the template for the tiny bubble. Secondly, uh, just something for people to think about, since this is for inventors that are trying to do it. I met some gentlemen uh, over the phone in 1997 that had been working with uh, hydrogen uh, and internal combustion engines, and they, had, they were working with a Wankel motor. And their theory was a little bit different than the Brown's Gas HHO uh, guys that are trying to do it. The Brown's Gas HHO guys that are doing it. What they were doing is they were taking and electrolyzing uh, water, creating hydrogen, and they were injecting atomized water vapor or fog into the combustion chamber, and then they were, they were igniting the hydrogen, and the flash point of the hydrogen was enough to create phase change. And they were then able to get over unity effects via phase change, which is n completely non-violative. And uh, in a Wankel engine, that lends itself uh, quite readily to that. And something if, for people to think about that are researching. And if that combustion event indeed uh, was a, as a plasma event, right, as it would, would be, it likewise could help the, the bubbles to right away form in the ball lightning, and that's where you're getting your, your big force anomaly to drive the, the Wankel engine. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Maury King.